So we are in part three of our sermon series entitled God Behind the Scenes. And uh, I would like to just ask you to bow your heads one more time in a word of prayer so we can invite the Holy Spirit to be here. Father God in heaven, today we are going through your word. And so we ask that you will speak to us because there is power in the word of God. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Send us your Holy Spirit, especially for me, Lord, because it's truly, it's your Holy Spirit that is our teacher this morning. And so I pray, Lord, that as we worship you in spirit and in truth, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together will be a blessing unto you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So... I just want to review a little. Last Sabbath, we started in chapter 1, even though it was part 2. We talked about three, three aspects, three things that happened. And they were all banquets. King Xerxes threw the first banquet. And if you remember, it was how long? Six months. Six months 180 days. I don't know if any of us have been to a banquet that's 180 days, much less two days. But he threw this banquet with specific intentions, and the intentions that King Xerxes had was to show his power, his might, his influence, and for those dignitaries that came, he wanted to kind of schmooze with them, but his ulterior motive was that he had intentions to enlarge his kingdom. His kingdom stretched from Persia to Ethiopia and in, in Africa. It was a huge kingdom. But his intentions were that he wanted to add Greece to his kingdom. And so this was one way that he could do it by getting everybody drunk and having a fiesta, a banquet, whatever you want to call, for 180 days. So he throws this banquet, and the king is not a wise man. You might think, well, how can he not be wise? Because he was uh, the king over a wide area. He was not a wise man. He himself got drunk. Others got drunk. And then it leads into the second banquet, because he was a little smarter with the second banquet. He did a second banquet for the workers, for the common people, but that was only seven days. At least he didn't forget those who helped put together a, a 180, a six-month-long banquet. And so he does this second banquet for the commoners, the workers, and, and, uh, and that goes fairly well but probably he got drunk and the others did as well. And if you remember, there was a third banquet. And the third banquet was given by whom? The queen. Queen Vashti. Now we're going through this book of Esther, and I personally think that this book reflects the great controversy. Good versus evil. A villain like Haman versus people who are good. And the reality is that we live in an era of good and bad in the world around us. And so this book of Esther reflects that. It reflects a great controversy motif, and you will see it as we go through the chapters. Ten short chapters. Today we're going to finish chapter one. And so Queen Vashti sets up a banquet for women. But something very important happened, and it happened in verse 10. And I'm going to share verse 10, 11, and 12 with you just so that we could recap before we get into verse 16 and we finish chapter 1, which is all the way to 22. And this is what chapter 1, verse 10 says. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, 
let's just put it this way, he was drunk. He was drunk. He told the seven eunuchs who attended him, in verse 11, to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty. He wanted the men to drool about the beauty, the physical beauty of Queen Vashti. For she was very be a beautiful woman, verse 12. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she did something that was unheard of. She refused to come, Scripture says. This made the king happy. It made the king furious. And he burned with anger. Xerxes was a narcissist. Xerxes, probably like most kings, got everything that he wanted. And so he's drunk as a skunk, and there's a lot of men at this banquet, and he wants to show off the physical beauty of the queen. And rather than the queen acknowledge that, the queen according to Persian custom, says, no way. I'm not going to parade myself in front of all these drunken men so that they can drool over me. Now, Scripture doesn't say it, but we, it's implied because she realized that Persian custom was, you don't do that. And yet, I am sure that she realized also I'm going against my husband, the king. Uh-oh, we have a problem here. We have a problem. So having said that, as a recap, we are now going to continue our spiritual journey. And I just want to remind you that there's two, there's two words, theological words, that um, just I might continue to remind you periodically in the next couple of weeks. And those two words that we will talk about, that we will mention, one is providence, and the second one is sovereignty. Let's take sovereignty. It's good that God is sovereign. That means God can do what he wants in behalf of us. When you and I pray for a miracle, a miracle of healing for someone, for yourself, a miracle for a job, or whatever it might be, God is sovereign to answer your prayer, answer my prayer, and God is sovereign because he does that for us. Where providence is, God does what he wants to do because he's God, but he wants to do it for us as well. And so those two words are theological words, but we'll see them throughout the, um, the journey in the book of Esther. Okay, so our theme verse... If I can get it to our theme verse, it's not clicking. There we go. Okay. So our theme verse for the series is taken from Romans 15, 4. And it says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our what? Instruction. Instruction. This book is a book that we will learn about human relations. We will learn about the great controversy motif, but we'll learn about human uh, emotions and human relationships. And then Paul goes on to say, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? Hope. We might have hope. Scripture gives us hope. Amen? Without scripture, without hope, we would be grieving like men, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, without any hope. But we have hope because the scriptures is full of promises, full of promises, full of uh, stories of, of God being miraculous. And so that's our theme verse for the entire series of Esther. So Esther chapter one, King Xerxes loses his, oh, let's go, I'm sorry, it clicked above, this clicker is uh, going faster than I am. 
I'm just trying to take it back. There we go. So King Xerxes loses his mind because of this 180-day banquet. But he also, uh oh, <laughs> it's uh, not cooperating. But he also loses his queen because he wanted to, as we said earlier, he wanted to exploit her beauty. And she says, okay. And she says, no way, Jose, I'm not going to do that. But now, Houston, we have a problem because she's disobeyed the king. And so we pick up at the last verse that we finished last week. What must be done to Queen Vashti, the king demanded. He's furious. He's angry. My wife, the queen, cannot rebuke me. She cannot go against my wishes. I'm the king. I'm a narcissist. And I want these drunken men to gaze on her beauty. What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? They're already coming up with a problem. In other words, they're coming up with the penalty. What must we do to the queen to teach her a lesson? And so that's where we left off last Sabbath. And we pick up with this 180 day feast and the burden by his own, in your sermon outline, foolishness of being drunk as a skunk. Because it will ultimately be a burden on him, which we will see. But I think it's important to remind us too that through this disobedience that Queen Esther was displaying, God's sovereignty is working. And you'll see what I mean, especially next week in chapter 2. Well, let's put it this way. Because of her disobedience, out goes Vashti and in comes Esther. Esther, who will be a savior to her people. And so King Xerxes' feast ended with this burden, his own foolishness. And you might be thinking, well, but pastor, you just said that the, the queen rebuked him and didn't want to parade herself. Yes, and she's going to pay that price. But again, God's sovereignty is that as a result of her integrity, because Queen Vashti was a woman of integrity. Queen Vashti had principles. And she's not going to allow the king, despite the fact that he's the king, to, to abuse her in front of all these drunken men. Because remember, he's got them at this banquet drunk, but he's also trying to manipulate them. Because he wants to enlarge, eventually, his kingdom. So, as a result of the king's 180-day, six-month feast, or war planning, there we go, Xerxes should have been careful not to command what may be reasonably disobeyed. But he's not thinking about that because he's drunk himself. He's not thinking that was a, you know, that that was probably not reasonable of me to ask my wife to come and parade herself in front of all these men. But he's not thinking that way. He's having the opposite, a temper tantrum as a narcissist. And his temper tantrum is being exacerbated by the eunuchs who tell him, Mr. King, your wife cannot get, along, uh, get away with this. You've got to do something to your wife, the queen. So for six months plus seven days, King Xerxes' banquet took center stage. Feasting, drinking were in full swing. The courtyard drama escalates because he is furious and there's something that has to be done to rebuke the queen. Something. So I shared this with you last week, and this 
helps ha have a little background about the king as well. Because Middle Eastern kings did not have close per personal relationships with their wives. Xerxes demonstrated this because, number one, he had a harem. He was no different than other Middle Eastern kings. But the harem woman obeyed him. And there's one reason why he didn't have a close personal relationship with his wife. Two, he showed no respect for her womanhood, for her personhood, even for Persian custom. And three, Esther, when she became queen, did not see him for long periods of time, according to Esther 4.11. And so there were already problems that you could see on the onset, at the outset, I should say. And so women in those days did not have a voice, a point underscored by Xerxes' lack of communication with his wife. Now, in that era, laws were very important, yet not when it came to resolving conflict. And there was a conflict here. Big time was there a conflict. Perhaps the king was not anxious to discover the reason behind her refusal. Or perhaps heart-to-heart -heart talks were not his forte. And I doubt it because he was a narcissist and he got everything that he really wanted. So I don't think that was his forte. Whatever the reasoning, he let the law lead rather than a relationship with his wife. Rather than realize I'm drunk, let me sit down with my wife. Let me reason with her. And probably what I said to her was not reasonable. And she had every right not to parade herself. No. He did not want to go that route. Because for him, it's about the law. Not the custom, but the law. So verse 16 says this. Memukan answered the king and his nobles. Queen Vashti had wronged not only the king but also every noble and citizen throughout the empire. Verse 17, women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands. Now this is Memukan telling this to the king. Despise their husbands when they, when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Verse 18, Come on now, cooperate. Oh. Okay, now there we go. Before this day, verse 18 is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia... <laughs> this, this clicker wants to do me in. It just it doesn't like me for some reason. Okay, back to verse 18, if we can. Oh my goodness. Okay. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. Verse 19. So if it please the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree. There's the law. Not relationship, but the law. Memukan is in a way manipulating the king. And so it says, he says, so if it please the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. Now let's stop before we get into verse 20. Right here you see some of the sovereignty of God. Something is happening, something's going to happen to Vashti, but God always has a plan B. Thank God. Now verse 20. When the decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. Now what was happening here was a type of an inner inner cabinet meeting of the king, his princes, his advisors, they're all consulting together. That's what's basically happening. 
and they are all agreeing that something has to happen to the queen. She can't get away with this. The king has to put this decree out, this law, so that the queen understands you will not ever be able to do this to the king, ever. Memukan was beginning to prove his worth because he's the main advisor to the king. And how is he proving his worth to the king? Because it was shrewd of him to take the heat from the king's personal resentment by putting the incident in a wider context, applying a law to it, a decree, an edict. This way the king has something to say that, hey, you disobeyed the king and as a result, according to the law, you're not going to get away with this. And so by gaining their support, he could make capital, brownie points, so to speak, because he's in the inner cabinet. He's advising the king. And it was a clever move to make the most of the fact that Memukin had an all-male gathering before him. So he takes advantage of this. And so by gaining their support, he could make capital of this unfortunate setback at the expense of Queen Vashti. Now who knows? Scripture doesn't tell us that he had anything, Memukin had anything against the queen. But Scripture does tell us that he was the main advisor to the king. And he wants in with the king. So he's advising him to banish the queen. In verses 19 and 20, Mimukin's exaggeration assumes that all women in your sermon outline will begin emulating Vashti's perceived disobedience, thereby causing a kingdom-wide feminist revolt. These men did not want the wives to revolt against the king. And that probably was not going to happen, but that's what Mimukin wa was trying to convey to the king. It probably wasn't the, the thing that was going to happen. Yet, I believe that Mimukin was manipulating the king to tell him, hey, that, that's what could happen, your majesty. So Mimukin's advice is threefold. One, he says to the king, dismiss the queen, dismiss Vashti. Two, Sir, you need to find another queen. And three, King Xerxes, issue this royal decree that Persian women should honor their husbands. Basically, get rid of her, replace her, and remind all the women that they should be submissive without a voice. Ouch. But that's what, what he was doing to manipulate the king. Because he, at this point in time, Memukin is the main advisor. And he wants in, but maybe I should say influence, with the king. And so he issues these, these three important advices. Memukin wanted an edict prohibiting king, Queen Vashti from ever entering the king's presence again. But in order for that to happen, it had to be written into the law of the Medes and the Persians, the law which can never, ever, ever be changed. And the queen would have known that. And so Memukin has the king do this because it's irrevocable. Once he signs this edict, this royal decree, it cannot, as much as if Queen Vashti would have went up to him and begged for mercy and for grace, you cannot do away with the law. But if it was after to get the women of Persia to have greater respect for their husbands, it was a strange way, very strange way to make that happen through a law. But that was what was happening. What we have to keep in mind here is that Esther doesn't have a clue of what's going on. Esther's a young lady. She's not in 
the royal court. Next week, we will see the Miss Persia pageant. But that's next week. Right now, Esther's a young lady in her late teens, perhaps, and she has no clue of what's going on. Not the foggiest idea. She also knows nothing yet about this royal edict which will set the events of motion, God's sovereignty in motion, and will not only change Queen Vasti's life, because she's now totally banished, and we will never see her again. But as I said, next week we will see the Miss Persia contest where Esther, through the sovereignty of God, will be part of that pageant. Esther is going about her own business, living for everyday life by fulfilling her daily responsibilities. We'll see this throughout the, the, the story of Esther where she's a very humble young lady, but she's fulfilling her own responsibilities because she was raised by her cousin Mordecai and she was raised as a young lady that fulfilled her responsibilities. Then we will see also the wonder of God's sovereignty, working behind the scenes. The Lord is moving through events and impressing minds through his Holy Spirit. And until he brings out even the most carnal and secular of settings, a decision that will set his perfect plan, his sovereignty into place. Therefore, Esther comes on the scene. And thank God that she does. Because Esther has a hidden secret that we will find out about next week as well. So by relying on the law and not on personal relationships and on the advice of Memukin, God allowed King Xerxes' communication failure to open up a, a vacancy because he had no communication with the queen. He didn't talk to her. Remember, he's got a harem, went very, very long periods of time without talking to his wife. That's why they're enacting a law rather than him talk to his wife. Why did you do what you did? Why didn't you respond when I asked you to respond in front of all the, the men at the banquet? So by relying on the law and not on personal relationships and on the advice of Mimukin, God allowed King Xerxes, his communication failure, to open up this, this vacancy in the queen's office. And that was for the one true God, the Lord, to save his people. Now, let me remind you, too, that in the entire book of Esther, God's name is never mentioned. That's why it's so important that we understand God's providence and God's sovereignty. That God works behind the scenes with his sovereignty for his will to happen, for his people to be ultimately saved. And this is a vital development in this plot of intrigue because Esther will become a savior for her people. Now, as we understand earlier in our spiritual journey, it was believed that the law of the Mersians, the Medes and the Persians could not be repealed according to one of Hammurabi's, Hammurabi's laws. Excuse me. The legendary code of Hammurabi originated from a Babylonian ruler named Hammurabi, oops, who lived from 1810 to 1750 BC. He authored about 282 laws or series of enactments to govern polite society on various subjects, including marriage, slavery, inheritance. Some of Hammurabi's laws are still used today, surprisingly. In fact, a reproduction of the portion of the Code of Hammurabi hangs in the building of the United States Supreme Court. The actual 7.5-foot original carving of the Code of Hammurabi stands preserved also in the Louvre in Paris, France. One of those laws contained in the Code of Hammurabi states that no judge could change a royal decree. Yet some historians believe that the laws of the Medes and the Persians mimicked 
the same parameters of the laws or the code of Hammurabi. Either way, King Xerxes, if you could put that back up, thank you, so-called wise men relied on those laws as an authoritative force in making their decisions. They, that was a background, that was a, uh, the substance of what they relied on. So by following the unwise suggestions of his so-called wise men, King Xerxes publicized his lack of authority and, in a way, an embarrassment. Because he's allowing these so-called advisors to tell him, use the laws, use the code of Hammurabi, get back at your wife. And that's what's happened. By following these unwise suggestions, these so-called wise men were making him look like a fool. Yet, as I've stated in our spiritual journey in the last two sermons, God not only moves in mysterious ways, but he moves in mundane ways as well. It may seem otherwise. But his hand is not removed from this or any other scene in the book of Esther. Even though the name of God is never mentioned, God's sovereign hand, we will see, is there to place Esther as the new queen, which we will see in the subsequent chapters. Now let's look at the outcome of Mumukin's rather um, direct suggestions here. In verse 19, so if it pleased the queen, excuse me, if it pleased the king, we suggest you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and the Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of the king and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. Here are four words that become a reality. Exit Vashti and enter Esther. And yet, remember, Esther doesn't have a clue of what's going on. Again, the sovereignty of God. She will have a clue soon. But at this point in time, Esther is a goner and soon, excuse me, Vashti is a goner and soon Esther will come in. And this reveals the wonders of God's sovereignty, working behind the scenes in order to save God's people. And ultimately, if you can remember that, you will remember that Esther became a type of a savior. The Lord is moving through the human events, inspiring minds until he brings out of even the most carnal and secular of settings, and we're going to see that throughout this story of Esther. Isaiah 55 says something very interesting. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 10. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Verse 11. So it is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I what? What I what? What I desire and achieve, the purpose for which I sent it. That's God's sovereignty. God in his ultimate wisdom knew this in advance. But he's allowing things to take place because he needs to save his people. Now we're going to look at the rest of Mamukin's idea for the king and the agenda behind his quite radical suggestions because that's what he's it's it is radical he's suggesting this for a purpose to get rid of Vashti verse 21 says this the king and his nobles thought his thought this made good sense so he followed Mamukin's counsel verse 22 
He sent letters to all the parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. I don't know if the king wasn't drunk, if he would have really said what is said in verse 22. But the idea of submission, as long as it's a biblical kind of submission, is what God desires. Not the submission from a king, not the submission of a tyrant, not the submission of a man who commands his wife to parade in front of drunken men. Because we don't bring about submission by edict or by laws, even if it's the laws of the purge, Persians and the Medes. And certainly not from some king whose own home and harem is in an uproar. So nevertheless, the edict goes out and the plan begins to unfold. Exit Vashti and soon enters Esther. Let me share with you a quote from a book that I used um, when I was writing this sermon. And this quote is from Alexander White in his book, Bible Characters, Volume 1, the Old Testament. He says, quote, let us take heed to note that the sacred writer's whole point is this. That the divine hand was all the time overruling Xerxes' brutality. Oops. Thank you was overruling Xerxes' brutality and Vashti's brave woman, womanliness and Esther's beauty and her elevation into Vashti's vacant seat. All this and more than all this to work together for the deliverance and the well-being of the remnant of Israel and still lay dispersed in the vast empire of Persia, end quote. In the midst of what was happening in the king's banquet hall, God's heart remains attached to his people. And the remnant Jews carried away from Zion and living in Persia. Because you remember in the, in the introduction, there were quite a few Jews that still remained in Persia. When Nebuchadnezzar allowed them to go back to the promised land, there were many Jews that were established. They didn't want to go back. They were successful business people. They were successful whatever they were doing. And there were many, many Jewish people that were left, even at their own peril, which we will see down the road. To keep his promise of preservation, preservation excuse me, preservation, the Lord must protect his people from extinction. And the time to do that was beginning. The events have been set into motion. Exit Vashti, enter in Esther. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. The wisdom of the book of Proverbs says it beautifully. That King Xerxes, who boldly proclaimed himself the king of this world for six solid months when he had this 180-day drunken banquet, yet Xerxes is a little player in the big picture hands of an almighty God whose sovereignty will happen. Amen? Because God has a plan, just like a plan for us. We're here to worship God today in spirit and truth. We've accepted his plan of salvation. We are Christians that are saved by grace through faith. Amen? And God's plan is to save us so that when Jesus comes through the clouds of glory, we will have that, pro, that promise fulfilled and we'll meet God and our other loved ones and patriarchs in the clouds of glory. And this is what happened here with the sovereign hands of an almighty God. Joyce Baldwin, in her small but helpful commentary on the book of Esther, writes this, quote, There are several 
ironic nuances, but the most obvious is the contrast between King Xerxes at the beginning of the chapter when he is the world's greatest monarch, rich and powerful, aloof, yet generous, and that same king by the end of the chapter attempting to maintain his dignity despite the defiance of his wife. This lawmaker of the Persians and the, P and the Medes, whose law could not be altered, was prepared to pass an edict framed in the moment of peak when he was not even sober. The counselors represented by Mimukin were clever, but hardly wise. The decree promulgated according to their advice made the king look like a fool in the eyes of his subjects. And he may even have regretted the banishment of Vashti in his better moments. So here, in the measure of the king who reigned over the world and had the future of all of his power, end quote. In other words, there's going to be a moment that perhaps he's going to regret what he did. But again, it's about law and not relationships. It's about good versus evil. It's about a villain that we will see right now is Mimukin, but it's going to change. So woven through the tapestry of this incredible story, we're going to find three timeless lessons as we finish this morning. Number one, God's plan. God has a plan for each of us. Amen? God has a plan, and his plan is a sovereign plan. God's plans are not hidden when the events of this world are carnal or secular. God is always at work. In a chaotic world like, that we live in today, God's at work. He's moving, he's touching lives, he's shaping kingdoms. No matter what happens at the election on this Tuesday or whenever we find out the results, if it is more chaotic than it is today, just remember this, God has a plan, amen? And we follow his plan, not the plans of man. He is never surprised by sinful humanity, what sinful humanity may do. Just because the, action, oh, just because the actions or motives happen to be secular or carnal or unfair doesn't mean he's not present. Those involved may not glorify him, but never doubt that God is present and at work. Number two, which is equally important, God has a purpose for every one of us. Amen? Whatever that may be, that's between you and God. Or maybe that's based upon your spiritual gifts. But God has a plan and he has a purpose for each one of us. And part of that purpose that I can tell you for sure is that we're called to serve a God that we can't see. God's purpose is not frustrated by moral or sinful failures because he is a God who applies grace to the overall view of life. Amen? No matter how, how much you think that you're too sinful to serve God and to serve his purpose, God's grace will cover your sin and my sin. And so we have to always remember that because there's an enemy, a villain, whatever you want to call him, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, the serpent. He wants you and me to feel guilty about the sins that we commit. But God doesn't want you to feel guilty. God wants you and me to go to him and say, Lord, I confess and repent and like 1 John says, you are faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from what? From all unrighteousness. God will forgive you of your sins and throw it in the ocean. Your past, your present, and your future. It's about God's grace. So God's purpose is not frustrated by moral or sinful failures. Because he is a God who applies grace to the overall view of life. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not 
from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by your works, not by my works, so that no one can boast. Amen? There's nothing that you can do that will gave, gain you salvation. I was 16 years old, and I went to Colombia to visit family. And in the capital, Bogota, Colombia is an extremely Roman Catholic country. But in the capital, Bogota, there is a very well-known Catholic monastery on the hill called Mozarate. And if you're a tourist, you, you go to Mozarate because it's on the hill and you have a spectacular view of the city. And so we took a cable car up from the bottom to the top. And so when we got to the top, I noticed something that I had never seen in my entire life. I noticed that there were people about 100 yards away from the cable car that were going up the mountain or the hill. And I wondered how they were going to get up there. And so when we got up to the top and we got off the cable car, I started seeing people with bloodied palms, with their pants, female and male, their knees bloodied. And I couldn't make that out. I, I, I couldn't understand. So I asked one of my aunts, I said, Tia, why are these people bloodied on their palms? Why, why are their pants, male and female? It's not like today's, um, <laughs> um, you know how, I'm not, I don't want to step on any of the ladies, but you buy pants with holes? <laughs> This was at a time that that wasn't uh, the, the, uh, the in thing. <laughs> you might blend in today, but back then I'm like, I don't get this. And so my tia, my aunt, says to me, those are Roman Catholics that are trying to gain God's salvation by crawling up the hill. Thank God it is by grace through faith that we are saved, not of your works. Amen? You don't have to do that. But yet, people don't understand the gospel, and they do. Jeremiah says it this way in the book of Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to what? Prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you, again, there's that word, hope and a future. Whenever you and I think that we're exhausted with what's going on in life, if you've been laid off, if you're sick, if a family member is dying, whatever it might be, remember Jeremiah 29 11. This is one of those promises that you need to remember like in Isaiah 41 10. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Despite what happens after Tuesday, despite what happens in the world, if the world lasts another year, know this, that our future is not here. Amen? Our future is in heaven. Our future is guaranteed because of the hope of the blessed coming. Number three, first, God has a plan. Second, God has a purpose. Number three, God's people. God's people are not excluded from high places because of handicaps or hardships. Esther was a Jew exiled in a foreign land, as we see next week. She was an orphan. She was light years removed from Persian nobility. She's a young lady, perhaps 14, 15, 16 years old. She has no clue what's going to happen in her life soon. She's a young lady such like Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti had integrity. 
Queen Vashti was a very wise woman. And soon Esther comes on and we will see the wisdom that her older cousin bestows upon her. But remember this, she was also an orphan. She was an orphan, yet none of that kept God from exalting her to a position that because of the sovereignty of God that he wanted her ultimately to have. Because God's sovereignty said, Esther, I have a plan for you. Esther, I have a purpose for you. And Esther, you are going to save my people. God's people. So in God behind the scenes, God's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so heavy that he cannot hear. Whether you, <laughs> whether you see him or not, because according to Scripture, none of us have seen him. But that doesn't mean he's not working sovereignly in your life. Amen? Whether you see him or not, the Lord is at work always, always in your life and in mine. Because God specializes in turning the mundane into the meaningful. God not only moves in unusual ways, he moves in providential ways. Because he is just as involved, just as involved in the mundane as in the miraculous. And Romans 8.28 tells us, Paul says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to what? To his purpose. We seek ye first God's kingdom, his righteousness, and his will. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for journeying with us through this first chapter of the book of Esther. We know that your name does not appear in this entire 10 chapters of Esther. But we know that you're working behind the scenes, providentially and because of your sovereignty. And so, Lord, we, we have seen where Queen Vashti is exiting. She maintained her integrity. She maintained her respect. And yet you've prepared a young lady by the name of Esther to come onto the scene. And one day, she will be the savior of her people. She will have the Christ-likeness, the integrity, the spiritual fortitude that she will listen to her older and much wiser cousin and become a savior to her people. Lord, I believe that in this church there are many Esthers. Lord, I believe in this church there are many Queen Vashtis, many ladies, many young ladies that have integrity. Why? Because they love you. They want to serve you faithfully. And so, Lord, you have given us as a church and as individual Christians a plan, and a purpose. And we pray that we will see that unfold in this incredible, epic book of Esther. So bless us with your Holy Spirit that lives in us to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us. We pray in the precious and almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.